Be seated. Welcome again to the orchard. I'm so good to have you here and um, excited about today. We get to wrap up a very short series, four weeks through the book of Colossians. And you may or may not be aware of what Colossians is. You may be visiting for the first time. You weren't here for the first three. But uh, this month, we've just taken time to walk through a a, a short book in the New Testament. It was written in AD 61 by this guy, Paul. He used to be called Saul. He had a huge transformation time, a huge change of life. He was one of the big religious leaders within the Jewish world. I mean, and matter of fact, he was a guy that was beating up Christians. He was beating them up, throwing them in jail. In some situations, they were actually killed, martyred, um, because he didn't like the message of Christianity. And then Jesus got him. Jesus caught up with him, and boy, did he ever change his life. So uh, we're going to dive into this letter that he wrote. And um, I'd love to have you follow along. If you have a Bible, that'll be great. If not, you can scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you, and that will take you to a, a page with a link to today's message, and that has the information in it. And um, you can follow along there as well. So I invite you to do that. Also, a big welcome to our online viewers. We have people all over the world watching today, and we're just grateful. Um, We even have people down in Vanuatu, right, David, that that watch. And and we're just, uh, we just welcome you, and we're just grateful to have you as a part of the orchard as well. So uh, I want to dive in on this book because it is a game changer. It has been a game changer for me as I've walked through it. And uh, so just a quick little background that catches up to speed, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, So Paul, like I said, he he wrote this book, uh, AD 61. He was the first big missionary. We talked about Missions 101 and the Perspectives course that Matt will be teaching. Um, He was the lead. He is the champion of, of, of mission work. And he was all over Asia Minor. And you'll see up here on the map, Um, that he was traveling all through these areas, and you'll see this this town called Ephesus, a little bit left to to where the arrow ends, and uh, and then to the right of Ephesus is Colossae, where the arrow points. And that is where he's writing this letter. So the background was this. When he was in Ephesus, there was a man, Epaphras, that was actually there, that was influenced by Paul, and probably some other people too. They went back to Colossae. They were in Colossae, and um, they started a church. And there was some really good stuff happening in the church. But there was also some interesting things got involved, which often happens because, you know, the church, as it comes together, interesting things can happen at times. And it's so important that, that, that you stay on track with what God has laid out as, as what, is, what is church all about? Why is church even here? And so what happened with them was they had this church, it was, it was good, but they, got, they started to let Greek philosophy and Jewish law and mysticism creep into the church. And so what that caused was this thing called syncretism, where they start to blend, okay, yes, Jesus is everything. Well, Jesus plus a little bit of philosophy and a little bit of law and and a little bit of mysticism. And not that those things are necessarily bad in and of themselves, but when you start to couple those with Jesus so that so that he's no longer the all in all, but it's it's Jesus plus, as Daniel chatted about a couple months ago, it creates all sorts of problems. So one of the problems was these elite, so to speak, syncretists, that man, they had all the right blends, kind of like blending just the right coffee. And, um, and that led to all sorts of confusion, as well as inferiority, because some folks just felt like, man, I can't blend this stuff. I can't get it right, because my life's not working well. And then other folks, it was all about the legalism and the asceticism, and consequently, it just led to exhaustion for people, because they're like, I'm trying to keep up, I'm trying to keep up, I'm trying to keep up, but I'm exhausted trying to keep up with all these laws you're laying on me. And it just led to condemnation. This sense of, you know, I stink. God doesn't like me. I'm not doing enough for God. And so it created these really weird things. So Epaphras goes back to Rome, evidently, gets with Paul, gets with Paul, who was in jail, actually, in Rome. And Paul writes this letter to Colossae. And he says in chapter 1, this big thing that we'll just review for a couple minutes, and that is that I have transferred you, transferred you from, God has transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Well, what does that mean? What he's saying is that this kind of stuff, taking Jesus and blending other stuff in, that, that's still darkness. Because what is darkness? Darkness is defined ultimately as the absence of light. It can be actually good things. We can actually do some good things in the kingdom of darkness because we're trying to achieve things, not a bad thing, 
but it's lacking the light of Christ. And that was the whole point. And, and so he said, in God's kingdom, in the kingdom of the sun, and the kingdom of the light, it's his presence is everywhere. And that verse, he transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And consequently, he, he finishes chapter one talking about the kingdom of light, and he talks about Jesus, and he talks about Jesus as the creator, the sustainer. He holds this whole thing together. In other words, he's over the everything. He's over the cosmos, the universe. His presence is everywhere, even earth. And here we are on earth, and his presence is all around us. And that's kind of where chapter one ends. And he gets to chapter two, and he starts saying, now let's understand more what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. And he, he says this, and I gave you this illustration. He said, it's this. This is primarily what it is. If this little card represents Jesus, he says, here's the deal. The secret to the kingdom is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That Jesus actually comes into our heart. When we open our heart to him, when we say, God, I believe in you. I'm, I'm choosing to believe in you. I open my heart to you. It says, Jesus comes in to the heart, and he's in us. And then in chapter 2, he says this other crazy, profound thing. He says, not only is Jesus in you, but you are in Jesus. He says, you have died with him. You have been crucified with him. You've been raised up with him. So he ultimately says that if this is Jesus' life, he came to the planet. He walked on the planet for 33 years. He died on the cross. He he went to the grave, he rose from the grave, and then he ascended into heaven about 50 days later. Um, what he's saying is, not only does that mean that Jesus can come into your heart, but that you go into Jesus, that our lives are placed in him. And you think, wow, how secure, how much more secure could we be than to know that we have the God of the universe who created all, of we, all that we see out there, and we have him inside of us. And not only that, right? But we're in him. We're in his presence. It actually says we've been raised up to the heavenlies with him. That there's a part of us, that spiritual part is in the heavenlies with him. So last week we talked about what does that mean? What does that look like? And I, I drew this heart for you. And I said, well, if my M represents mind and E represents emotions and W rep represents uh, will. That as he said in chapter 3, in, in the first few verses, set your mind on the things above where your life is hidden with Christ. Whoa, that's profound. That there's a part of me that as I set my mind up here, I realize that I not only have Christ in me, but that what that does, it, it just fuels the Spirit of God in me because we're a body, we're a soul, and we're a spirit. And what happens when you go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light is you go from doing good and bad to being alive. And you realize that the whole message of Christianity is not about jumping through hoops. It's about allowing your spirit to become alive. That it's, it's brought to life through the presence of Jesus in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That it joins with our spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.17 says, he who joins himself with the Lord has become one in spirit with him. That down in the deepest recesses of our heart is the God of the universe. And he's constantly working and working to, to, to help us grow and mature and develop. And he says that as you set your mind up here, more and more of that happens. And he also said, because these little black dots represent the holes in our hearts. And those holes in our hearts often lead us to do things we really don't want to do. We often get involved in stuff. And he gave us a list of pride and lust and immorality and all these different things. And he says, you know what? God loves you. And you can try to fill your heart with those things, but God's got something so much better. And it's his presence. Let him fill the holes of your heart. Let him be the one that, that, that radically changes you. So that you're not trying to fill the holes of your heart with stuff that never ultimately fills the holes of your heart. It's all temporary. It may give you a quick buzz, a quick fix, but you know what? It doesn't last. 
And he says, the only thing that lasts is when you're tapped into eternal life, and eternal life is fueling your spirit in such a way that it fills the holes of our heart, heals the holes of our heart. That's why Jesus said, I'm the great physician, or he spoke of him that he's the great physician. He heals. He doesn't, doesn't just fill temporarily. He heals the holes. So where does that leave us today? The question, well, what now? We hit chapter 4, the last chapter. And if you've been here for all four weeks, well done. I, I love going through a book like this. I, I just love, wow, start to finish. You know, we often could start something or look at something, we don't quite finish it. This is an opportunity for us to see chapter 1 to chapter 4 to see it wrapped. And so let's dive in and see what he has to say in chapter 4 about what now. And what we're going to realize out of the gate is that it has a lot to do with this thing called purpose. The number one question we get as pastors is office often, hey, wh wh I'm trying to figure out what God's doing with my life. Where does God want me to go in my life? What's God want me to do with my life? What's my purpose? Number one question that we often get as pastors, and that's where Paul goes now, is to say, okay, in light of all that, in light of chapters 1, 2, and 3, now we come to four, and I'm going to give you where you go from here, what it means to have purpose in life. And so, a couple thoughts on that, a couple keys to understanding purpose. Number one <clears throat> is this, that we begin to view our purpose not as behind me, well, what am I doing with my life? How is my life going? Am I happy with my purpose? Do you hear a common word in there? My? All about me? And what he's saying, and what we're going to see him say, is that, and what he really said in chapter 3, is that we need to begin to look at our lives and our purpose through the lens of heaven. That we begin to look down as we look at the earth, and we begin to say, rather than what am I doing with my life, God, what are you doing with the planet as a part of your presence, of your kingdom. What are you doing and how do I find my place in that? Do you see the difference? Very big difference. Just think about it. I mean, this is why this kind of thinking, which is very self-ish, very self-driven, drives us down the wrong paths. And I, I would even venture to say this, until we begin to look at our purpose through the eyes of heaven, the eyes of God in heaven, as, until we look at our purpose that way, it's really hard to understand our, our purpose on the planet. Until we, we really look at the bigger picture of what God is doing, do we really understand our role in it and our, our place in it? We often are just like, well, what am I supposed to do with my life? Like I said, and what Paul is inviting us to do is to say, let's look at life from, from the place of heaven. And let's look at the big picture so that we can then identify the small picture. It doesn't work the other way. He also says this, another key to it, and if you hear nothing else, maybe, maybe hear this. God is more interested in how we go about our purpose than what we do for a purpose. God cares about what we do, but he's more interested in how we're going about the purpose than what we're doing as a purpose. And we're going to see how he plays that out in chapter 4. So let's dive in. Verse 2 of chapter 4, because last week ended on four. Chapter 4, verse 1, and he says this, Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. And if you're like me, you're like, oh, really? That's where we start prayer? I, I think prayer is one of the hardest things to do. I, I, I really think there's so many distractions. There's so many things that get in the way of it. I don't know about you, but... For many, many years, boy, prayer for me was just like all over the place. It was like I'd try to start praying and then my mind wander here or my mind wander there or, the, or this thing would beep. 
And, and I'm like, whoa, where, where was I again? What was I praying for? And he begins to develop this sense of having a very sober mind, a very alert mind to prayer. He uses uh, this word alert mind, which really means to just be focused, to be undistracted, um, to, be, to be aware. And what I would say, it, it's, it's praying from heaven. It's praying from our place in heaven, thinking about, okay, Lord, what are you doing down here? Try that the next time you, you get some time for prayer, which I encourage every day, every morning. And I realize some of us just have a bigger challenge than others with that because of maybe young kids or maybe just a, a work schedule, different things. Um, I, I would just really encourage that um, more than anything, you think about, I'm going to focus right here. I'm going to look at the things I'm praying for from, from heaven rather than from earth. Rather than thinking, well, okay, I've got to pray for this, pray for this, pray for this person, that. Good stuff. Good stuff. But begin to say, Lord, what are you doing on the planet? Let me start praying from that perspective. How are you working, God? And be quiet and listen and let him speak. And he says, also do it with a thankful heart. And I'll be honest with you, I, I don't know if I prayed much of my Christian life, which has been 30 plus years, with a thankful heart. I think I tended to pray more with a, I won't use the word greedy heart, um, but it was like, what, what needs do I want to see met? Maybe for other people even. But it's all about what needs do I want to see met, which isn't, again, a bad thing. There wasn't a lot of thankfulness. And it wasn't until these past few years when I began to develop what I'll just call a framework for prayer. A, a, a sense of, you know what, I'm going to go after some things, but I'm going to do it around three key words. My faith in God, my oneness with God, and my purpose for God. Faith in God, oneness with God, purpose for God. And you know what was so interesting? As I go back and read a book like Colossians, that's really what Paul's talking about. The first part, he talks about faith and being in awe of God. The second part, two and three, is all about our oneness with God. And chapter four, as we're talking today, is about our purpose for God. And so it's a framework. It's not, it's not a, a, a literal, okay, say this word now and this word now and then that word and that word. It's not a ritualistic, I got to just say everything just right. It's like saying, Lord, I'm going to pray around these three things with a perspective from heaven. And it's been a game changer for me. And I invite you into that. I'm going to be doing a class in September called Next Steps, a new class I'm releasing. It's not on the website yet. It's on Sunday mornings, 1030 a.m., this hour right here uh, in the boardroom, where I'm going to walk through those three things, faith, oneness, and purpose, and simply talk through not only the, 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 what that is all about, but then how do we pray into that? How do we make that real in our life? So I invite you into that. You'll hear more about that in the future, but just a quick side note while we're on the topic. But then Paul goes on, and he says this, pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ, which as we said in chapter 2, Christ in us, the hope of glory. That is why I'm here in chains. And notice verse 4, Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Now, if you were in Paul's place, if I was in Paul's place, and I have an opportunity to encourage this church back in Colossae to pray for me, and I'm in chains in Rome, what do you think I'm most tempted to ask prayer for? Get me out of these chains, right? Lord, help me. Have God get me out of these chains. And he prays, pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Wow, that's a different perspective. See, that's, that's prayer from top down rather than bottom up. That's prayer looking at life from God's perspective, from a heavenly perspective, rather than us just looking and say, okay, God, where are you? Somewhere out there, please help me. It's like, oh, wait a minute, God, this is what you're doing. You have me in jail in Rome, and you know what? You're going to use this. 
I don't know who. I don't know how long I'll be here. Not there's anything, not there's anything wrong with praying for circumstances. That's an okay thing. But, you know, while I'm here, use me. Let me be a light for you, God. So, you know, you think about it. Don't we? I mean, we're just tempted to pray for our circumstances. And that is bottom-up prayer rather than top-down prayer. So I encourage us. God cares about those things. We do need to pray about them. But more than anything, let's pray about how God wants to use my circumstances rather than get me out of my circumstances. He goes on and says, now live wisely. Now he gets into directly into our purpose. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. So now he's saying, okay, now that you've prayed up, now that you've, you've, you've kind of prayed from top down, now let's look outwards. In other words, if here we are on the earth, we start to look at this person and this person, and we start to ask the question, Lord, how can I be a light to them? And he says to do that, live wisely, meaning calmly, peacefully, live as a servant, and make the most of every opportunity. So I just want to say this, you know, no matter where we are, no matter what day it is, it is an opportunity. Do you go out to lunch after this? It's an opportunity. It may be the way you treat your waiter. It may be God tells you to buy lunch for the people sitting next to you that you don't even know. It may be you go on a hike today and you bump into someone and you just ask them about their day. How are they doing? It doesn't matter whether you have a business or whether you're a barista. God wants to use you and me in whatever area of influence we have in every opportunity. Every opportunity we have to be a light for Christ so that we can take this right here, and this is all he's saying. Now that you're here, now that you got this, take this out to the world and be a light. Let people see this inside of you. Let the life of this, the idea of Jesus in you, you and Jesus, let this just shine to the world. Actually, some of the words he uses here in another version, it says, let your speech be seasoned with grace as though it was salt. What does salt do? It whets our appetite. It makes us thirsty. That our lives, people ideally will look at our lives and say, I want what you have. I want what you have. And you know what? If, if we're struggling with that, I get it. I've been there. We're like, man, I don't feel like anybody wants what I got. You know what? We go back to chapters 1, 2, and 3 because the answer is in there. Somewhere in there is the answer to being chapter 4 and being that light for the world. And that's why we have David, of course, and on staff now leading our discipleship. Because this is a discipleship issue. We get it. It's not like, wham, bam, there you go. You got it. You heard the message today. You're good. Go have fun. Go be a light. Everything's going to be perfect. No, we understand. There's challenges. There's hurts. There's wounds we all have to work through. And that is why we're here. That's why we're just not a Sunday church, but we're a Monday to Saturday church. That things happen throughout the week, starting with our, our small groups, that we'll be talking about in the upcoming weeks, as well as our equipping center, as well as our counseling and recovery classes, as well as our discipleship groups. That these things all exist so that we can be the brightest light we can be while we're on the planet. Because when we get to heaven, we don't need to do that any longer. <laughs> this is our only opportunity to be a light in darkness, because in heaven there is no darkness. So we have an opportunity not to drift back here and live this life, but to take this life over here and make a difference in other people's lives that are struggling in that area. So with that, Paul gives us an example of what it looks like for him. I'm just going to read through these. These are the, the people, in a sense, he influenced. 
the people he was a light to. And so he does this, I mean, he's given us the final instructions and greetings. He's saying goodbye in the letter and hey, so-and-so, so-and-so. But just listen for the relationships, for the, ha, the relationships he had with these people. Tychicus will give you a full report about how I'm getting along. He is a beloved brother and faithful helper who, who serves me in the Lord's work. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are doing and to encourage you. So here's w- w- one of Paul's relationships, this, this guy Tychicus, who's, who's obviously a guy that's just come along and he, he's gotten Colossians 1 through 3. He's gotten discipleship from Paul and now he's going and living it. And he's carrying it on to others. And he says, I'm also sending Onesimus, the faithful and beloved brother, who will tell you everything that's happening here. And what's so important about Onesimus is this. Onesimus was a thief. He was actually somehow associated, he worked for this guy Philemon, was a slave, as I said a few weeks ago, that's kind of employment back then in some ways, and he stole from him, and he bolted off to Rome. And my gut is he got in trouble in Rome too, ended up in prison next to who? Paul. (laughs) Isn't God interesting how he works? how he orchestrates, and he brought that together, has Onesimus in Rome, Paul ministers to him, whether he's a Christian or not, I don't know, but all I know is that it changed Onesimus' life, so much so that he went with Tychicus back to Colossae, where Paul wrote this letter to Philemon, you can go read that one, that's a one chapter one, that's a real easy one, and he instructs Philemon, hey, take this guy back, he's in a good place. God's really transformed and changed him. And I just want you to see how God's life works in Paul's life and through Paul's life because it's the same thing God can do with us. Who knows who we may run into? Who knows who we may get a chance to shine some light to? And their life is radically changed. And, And here's the beautiful thing. This guy was a thief. This guy was a thief. We'd say, oh, Not Paul. Not Paul. You saw that as an opportunity. (laughs) He didn't care about your background. God does not care about our backgrounds. He doesn't care where we've been or what we've done. His message is transformative for anyone. No matter who we are, no matter who we've done. If you're here today and you're like, you know, you, you don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter. God's message The message of Christ can transform anyone, anytime, any place. So Onesimus is radically transformed. And then it goes on, he talks about um, Aristarchus, who was in prison with me, sends your greetings, and so does Mark, Barnabas' cousin, as you were instructed before. Make Mark welcome if he comes your way. Interesting thing about Mark was that Mark and Paul went sideways early on in in their life. And, and, And Paul didn't even want Mark around him which is a hard thing to understand, but whatever reason, it wasn't there. But later on, Paul says, have Mark come to me and have him bring the parchments, which were the letters. And and, and there's this redemption, another sign of what the work of Christ does to redeem a soul, to redeem a relationship. So not only does he just save those who are thieves or whatever, those that we we go sideways with, which happens to all of us because we're imperfect people on an imperfect planet, he can heal that. And he healed the situation with Mark. And then he says, Jesus also sends his greetings. Those who are Jewish believers among my co-workers, they are working with me here in the kingdom of God. And what a comfort they have been. And Epaphras, that's the guy that started this whole process of telling Paul about what was happening here. Epaphras, a member of your own fellowship and servant of Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. He's always praying for you earnestly. You know what? I think he was probably praying. He says here, asking God to make you strong and perfect, fully confident that you are following the whole will of God. And I can assure you that he prays hard for you and also for the believers in Laodicea and Heropolis. So he's, he's praying that this will happen in the life of those people. Luke, the beloved doctor who wrote the, the, the third gospel, Mark wrote the second gospel, sends his greetings, and so does Demas. Demas, unfortunately, it says later on in 2 Timothy 4, a letter written five years later that that guy went sideways and he, uh, 
He fell away because he loved the things of the world. Interesting. He loved the things of the world. He got back into this. Um, please give my greetings to our brothers and sisters at Laodicea and Nympha and the church that meets in her house, a woman that was leading a house church. After you have read this letter, pass it on to the church at Laodicea so they can read it too, and you should read the letter I wrote to them. And say to Archippus, be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you. Archippus probably needed a little encouragement. Because you know what? Following the Lord, at times it gets a little bit challenging. Man, things just happen. We get hit with things, and we can get beat up. And it's just like, hey, stay the course. Stay the course. God's got you. Stay the course. Um, Here's my greeting in my own handwriting, Paul. Remember my chains. In other words, pray for me in jail. And may God's grace be with you. And he wraps up Colossians. And I just want to wrap up this message in this series by saying, you know, the whole purpose, the purpose he gives all of us is to go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference in the world by being his light. That's our big overarching purpose. And is that owning a business? Again, is that being a barista? Whatever it may be, <clears throat> our overarching purpose is go make a difference in the world and be a light for Christ. And how do we get there? Well, Paul gives us three things here. Praying, focusing on our purpose, on that purpose, and being connected to people. And you'll see these three action points as, as, as we walk away. Boy, pray. Pray with, a, as it says, a prayer life with an alert mind and a grateful heart. Purpose, be focused on our purpose to live wisely and to be, to be that, that, that attractive light for people. And then be about people. That we realize our life on the planet is about people. And that's why here at the orchard, we say love God, love people. Love him, be filled with him, and now let's go love the world. Interestingly, chapters 1 and 2 of Colossians, about loving God. Chapters 3 and 4, about loving people. That's just the way God works. It's not complicated. And his beautiful message to just simply, you know, get connected. Let, let the life of God flow through you that you go and be a light to this world. What a blessing. It is a privilege, folks. And we get to heaven someday, and we get to see all the lives that were impacted by our life on the planet. Not because we had to, but because we just showed up. We just showed up at Starbucks. We just showed up at work. We just showed up at, on the mountain, hiking. And God used us. What a privilege. It is a privilege. So I encourage you, you know, and this is why we say connect with us, get involved in our small groups, the equipping center and various things. But I also ask you this, you know, who's your go-to people? Who's my go-to people? You know, there's a couple people in my life. These are my go-to people. If I'm down, I'm out, I got go-to people. I go to to say, come on, I need your prayers. I need your help. And then there's folks that look at me the same way, that I get to be their go-to people, go-to person. And I encourage you to evaluate that. That's why we encourage community, having faith friends at church, to experience that. So come and see us. We'll help you get connected. We love you. We're here for you. We realize this journey through life is not always easy. We're here to walk with you. And uh, we're excited for you because we know God wants nothing more than to know you deeply and for you to sh shine brightly for him. So let me pray. And we're going to take communion. And uh, if you've never opened your heart to God, I invite you to pray with me right now and do that. And then we'll take communion together and just say, Jesus, I, I, I come before you. I, I open my heart to you. I invite you in. Bring, come into my heart and bring me into your life and let me live for you now. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for giving me new life. In Jesus' name, amen. And that's what communion represents.
bread that was broken, as Jesus said, this is the, my body that was broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And then the blood. The juice represents the blood, and he says, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins to give you new life. So drink this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand and worship. Oh, we got a couple great songs. And start to look at earth from heaven through these two songs. They will lead you there.